I'm Roger Lynn, and um, I'm here with uh, Nine Millie Productions, and uh, to talk about drum machines and hip hop and music and the influence of electronics on music and basically anything they want to talk about. My father was a uh, uh, professor of music theory and composition at the University of Southern California. And my mom was an opera singer, so there's a lot of music around the house. Uh, but my intentions were not the, the classical music. I, I like the Beatles and Stones and all that. Right? I'm 50, so I was born in 55. Um, and so, uh, but at the same time, I had a great interest in electronics. Something about that. I felt like there was some sort of magic and art somewhere around Avenue Electronics. And, and when the, uh, so anyway, I was a guitar player, and I always liked the electronics of the guitar and, and uh, you know, the processing that you could do with guitar, and in general, the, the influence on te of technology on music. Um, so uh, uh, actually, when I was fast forward to a teenager, I, was, uh, I got my first computer when I was about um, 18 or 19, and uh, I started to mess with that because uh, I thought there was something interesting inside those boxes and I wanted to get it out, something that was musical. And I started to mess with that and writing some programs and uh, trying to um, make musical pro programs, sequencing uh, um, and elementary uh, sound processing. And uh, at the time I had, I had worked, uh, in, when I was about 20 and 21, I, had, I was a touring guitar player and I had toured with um, this artist who was popular at the time named Leon Russell. And uh, Leon, he was popular in, in, in the United States, particularly in the southern United States. And uh, he used to record with drum machines as uh, existing drum machines. And there have been drum machines since the um, early 70s. They were made by um, oh, Ace Tone, Japanese company, and, and who was the founder of that company was the founder of Roland, uh, Akutaro Kakahashi. And uh, uh, so they made these very simple drum machines that would have you know, buttons that said rock one, rock two, and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then a tempo control and a volume knob, and that was it, start and stop. Uh, and so Leon would record with these simple machines merely to have a better sounding metronome as recordings because he really liked to overdub, and he had these, at the time, they were very elaborate, uh, these 40-channel tape recording machines. And so uh, I was enlightened by Leon to the advantages of recording with drum machines because uh, you made sure that you had a good groove going underneath it all, so if you needed to replace the drummer, you could, which is very, very nice. And so, um, I, I, when, I, when I do my own songwriting demos, I'd, I'd use the drum machines. But the trouble with it is, is that um, they all sounded like noisemakers, like crickets. They were all bad sounds. And also, they weren't programmable. And so, um, since I had been messing with computers around that time, uh, and I learned about the concept of visual sampling, because they were actually elementary uh, digital tape recorders, and there were some academic papers about digital sampling on the market, and on the, not on the net, but circulating around. And so um, it occurred to me that if, you, if I wanted to make the sounds better, there's, a, there's only so far you can go with sound synthesis, which is what they did at the time. They had little noise makers and tone generators, and, and those early drum machines sounded kind of like a TR-808, except not as good. They re roll and refine analog uh, drum sounds, in the TR-808, and of course, you know, they've become famous, they're very good sounds. But at the time, they were just sort of little booms and, you know, <laughs> sounds. And they didn't really sound like great, and people complained about them. So anyway, I figured, um, even though digital temp sampling took a, a huge amount of money, uh, of, of memory, uh, to store things on, on, in on tape at the time, I thought, well, geez, even though computer memories are very expensive, I only need to st store one bass drum, one snare drum, I guess a hi-hat, most of the time it's closed, that's not very much. Maybe a snare drum, I mean, or a tom-tom, and oh, the cymbals, who cares about the cymbals? They take too long, but somebody can overdub those. So I thought if I could just store little bits of memory, uh, and then I wrote a program on one of my early computers to sequence the beats together, and made a machine that had um, uh, a metronome, and then pads you could play with your fingers, and, and um, uh, in time of the metronome, and then invented uh, quantize and uh, swing timing along with that. So when you just play it in real time, it comes back sounding more like you were thinking of anyway. And this eventually became the LM1 drum computer, which was the first programmable digital drum machine. Now, 
No, don't play drums at all. If I was a drummer, I would have made a guitar machine. But you know, largely, I made the MPC in the first place because I was a songwriter, and um, and I had trouble making my own songwriting demos. Uh, it, I, because the drums were the hardest thing to play. I could play guitar, I could play some keyboards, I could play bass, but I couldn't play drums very well. And recording drums in your house is always hard. And so I wanted a machine that, that made my songwriting demos uh, easier. And interestingly enough, um, and this is you know years ago, but one of the first songwriting demos I did with my original prototype of my first drum machine ended up being a hit uh, recorded by uh, Eric Clapton, who was at the time, you know, I don't know if you know Eric, you know Eric Clapton, right? And, and so, uh, and this was in 1979. No, yeah, uh, yes, 1979. <clears throat> and so, um, I, I, yeah, I just wanted something that, that basically allowed me to make better songwriting demos. No, I'm a horrible drummer. I, I can play a little bit, I can hit some drums, but my timing's not that great for drums, you know. My timing's good for guitar, and, and I can tap on the pads, but that's why I invented Quantize and Swing. So I could make it sound the way I heard it in my head without having to play it. No, I'm not a drummer. Well, <clears throat> the pads I had done uh, earlier when I had my company, Lynn Electronics, uh, in my product, the Lynn 9000, <clears throat> that had touch sensitive pads, and that was basically an answer to the, the need to have pads that were touch sensitive. Because the drum machines at the time basically were using normal buttons, and if you played play them lighter, you played the hard. I played them hard, you had the same volume and the same uh, the sound. So um, I wanted to create some sort of a technology that would do this um, in, a, in a way that felt right to drummers. So in the Lin 9000, I tried one thing. It was okay, but it, it actually wasn't as good as what came afterwards. Um, and we actually, before the demise of my company, Lin Electronics, had a product uh, that it was never released called the Lindrum MIDI Studio. <clears throat> and this had a better technology for pads. And this technology was actually used in the, uh, the Akai product. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a way of, of, of sensing the, the <clears throat> how hard you play the pad. But the added benefit is that it not only senses how hard you strike it, but how hard you press on it. It, it senses the pressure as well. And uh, so when I discovered that, I thought, well, wouldn't it be a good idea to find some way to use that varying pressure? So I came up with the idea of the note repeat feature, where on the MPC, as it was on the Lin 9000, you could press this button called note repeat, and while you're doing that, vary the pressure on a pad, like a hi-hat, and it would automatically play, uh, say for example, 16th notes in your selected swing time, as long as you would hold both down. And so by varying the pressure, you'd get that sort of a And you could get the rhythm that maybe you didn't have if you weren't a great uh, rhythm player. But you could get uh, a wonderful dynamic and syncopated feel. And it was a new way. And now, of course, everybody else has copied it, like they've copied the, the quantize and the swing. But that's good. It seeds and you, you put an idea in out and it goes into the world and ultimately it raises the whole standard. You know, so I'm not complaining. In, in the 70s, Everything was analog synthesis, and then there were some uh, digital synthesis methods like uh, the, the first frequency modulation synthesizers. Um, and at all the trade shows, all the musicians would come up and say, can you give me your best horn sound, or your best string sound, or your best um, ensemble brass or piano sound? And people would take their analog synthesizers and tweak them to try to get them as close as they, were, they could, but ultimately people wanted realism. That was what really people wanted at the time. Um, and then when sampling came along, it gave them ultimate realism. So there was, that was really what they wanted. They wanted to compete with the real instruments. So I think there was a perceived great need for uh, ultimate realism. And the only reason that it didn't happen before, I think, is probably not so much for lack of ideas, but for lack of uh, low prices. Because um, as I said before, uh, there was, uh, there were, there was a digital tape recorder on the market. It was made by uh, the 3M company's collaboration with BBC in, in England. I guess I'm pointing to England, I guess. <clears throat> and, uh, and that would actually sample your music in, but there was no memory. It would immediately convert into numbers and store that as a stream of numbers on tape. 
uh, which is the only way they could store it. Because at the time, there were early computers that used tape reels and stored numbers on tape. So they were merely taking a, a computer data recorder, converting sound into data, and storing it as data. <clears throat> the, uh, when I first came up with sampling, I think actually sampling is pretty much split between me and the Fairlight Company of Australia that made the early um, uh, samplers, and their product was $30,000. You know, another thing that was completely unreachable by musicians that really had creativity. Uh, and, and we were both trying to do this realism and sound. The advantage I had is I didn't have to store as much uh, as a keyboard instrument sound. You know, they, wanted to, they needed to store a piano sound or a brass sound, so it had to be a lot longer. But a snare drum is about maybe a quarter second, if you don't include the ambience they're recording and add it later. So, um, I think there was a great perceived need for realism, and I just realized that, that the best way to do it was to sample it and, and into computer memory. And even though computer memory was horribly expensive, since I didn't have to sample that much uh, for a few hits of a drum strikes, then I could do it relatively cheaply anyway. And the first product I made was uh, $5,000, which was the LM1 drum computer, the one that was used on the early Prince recordings and a lot of Stevie Wonder recordings and stuff like that. So. They solicited my uh, designs, uh, just talents for further products. They figured they could uh, go on their own, and, and, um, and, and they didn't want to not pay my royalty. They st so they started to try to get rid of me, but I had to challenge Akai legally, and then they had to keep paying me. But unfortunately, um, just in this, about a year ago, Akai was bought by an American company. Uh, the, the guy that owns Newmark, he either bought it or it, Newmark bought it, and he's really kind of a jerk, and he just stopped the payments entirely. So. Uh, anyone who wants to stop buying Newmark products or releases or Kai products, I certainly wouldn't mind. Uh, because they tried to stop paying me then. <clears throat> uh, they actually very aggressively solicited all my design ideas and then stopped returning my phone calls and then finally told me they were going to stop paying me and I produced the new product, which at the time was the MPC 2000. Um, and they produced that and and, uh, and then I mentioned to them, I said, hmm, when I finally saw it, I said, hmm, you've used all my designs in this product, and yet you're not going to pay me. And I, if I look at my contract here, it says that my designs are protected. And they said, oh, I see. Well, they, and they, they said, okay, well, I guess we'll have to pay you then. The difference between the MPC-16 and the 3000 is mostly more and better. Uh, it has better quality sound, it has a faster processor inside, it has more memory, it has filters, it has um, uh, uh, built-in delay capability, um, a headphone jack. I think the original one, no that's right, the original one, yeah, the original one did not have a headphone jack. The MPC-62 added a headphone jack. <clears throat> but it's basically more better uh, and, and using the technology at the time. Otherwise, Fundamentally, there's not as much difference. I think the main thing, the, one of the main things people perceive as different about it uh, was the addition of the dynamic filters. So you could um, do things like when you play the pads, you could have a filter that is higher if you press it harder or lower if you press it lower. And you got some very, very nice effects because of that. <clears throat> so that helped out a lot. Um, but other than that, I think people use it for basically the same thing. Uh, for um, for the ability to uh, create grooves. I prefer the 3000 because it's, it's, um, it's basically more advanced technology. It actually has tighter timing than the MPC-60. Um, uh, it's funny because a lot of people have said that they like the MPC-60. Uh, they like its sound. It's a grainier sound. But you can sample grainy sounds and it'll Play them back with all their poor granularity in an MPC 3000. <clears throat> it'll it'll very very accurately reproduce, reproduce any bad sound you want to put into it. <clears throat> but you know it's bad is is purely in the, the ears of the beholder. Uh, it's something that's more interesting or has more character if it has a little distortion or lack of high end or something like that. <clears throat> but yeah, the, I, I prefer the 3000. Candidly. What I told him is I think that you don't want to make a machine too complex and have to have it try to do everything. And I think initially with the 4000, what they did is they tried to 
listen only to the people who were always telling you for more features. And often those aren't the people that really use the machine. And I think one of the beauties of the MPC series is that um, it's made for me, and I'm a guy that doesn't like to read manuals. I'm a guy that likes to walk up to the machine and without re making a manual, figure, oh, there's record, there's play, there's preset, da-da. Now I can use it. <clears throat> I want to make music. And even if you know the machine, sometimes some of the machines out there are very hard to start working with. You know? And so I think in the 4000, it's, I think they went a little bit overkill, at least at first. It did too many things, and it was too expensive. And the other thing, too, about expense is, although I've, I'm not famous for making the cheapest products, is the most creative people are usually not the people with the most money. I mean, new ideas usually don't come from, from people with money. Usually it's the people with money, in my observation, that are good about taking ideas from the from the poorer people that first had them and making them into a more commercial state. But, <clears throat> you know, you make a machine that's ex as expensive as the 4000 and and a lot of people can't afford it. And to me, the people who can't afford it are the guys that really come up with the, the great seeds of ideas, you know. So I, I like the idea of, of trying to really grind the cost down if I can while not omitting things that really inspire creativity. You know? But then again, you know, 4000 is a great product. They did a good job with it. I think that what I had in common with uh, hip hop was is that, that hip hop really understands the groove. And I don't even know if that's the right word to use. That's what I use. But the groove being, you know, a beat that if there's a good groove happening, you can't not, not move because it's so compelling and, and uh, <clears throat> and there, people have tried to analyze what makes a good groove, but um, ultimately just some people are better at making good grooves. And the nice thing about the MPC is I think it was really set up for making that groove right. I, I, I took, and the same thing with the, the Lynn products too, that's the 9000, but the, all the products, <clears throat> I think in general I tried to make um, the timing as accurate as possible. So. At least what you were trying to get, you could get, and then you could move it around from there. But all those little things, like the subtle variations of swing, and the ability to get good dy dynamics, and um, um, and just the tightness of timing, uh, made the MPC appear in a lot of people's ears to have the capability to groove easier when you just use it the first time. I remember I was talking to um, Bruce Swedeen, who was the engineer who made all the 80s Michael Jackson records and a bunch of others. He's sort of Quincy Jones engineer. And a real bright guy, and a very nice guy too. <clears throat> and he claimed that even when they do just bass and snare on a record, that it, had a, it, it would groove more than, at the time, some of the early computer programs. And, and, uh, and I think it's because in a lot of those computer programs, <clears throat> computers are doing a lot of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with music. And uh, there's little interrupts, they call them, that are always in the background. And, and making that timing just a little bit ragged. And so it makes it unpredictable. And the MPC was set up so that timing was God. <clears throat> Everything else was secondary. And, and so you tended to step up to an MPC, and what you put something in tended to sound, tended to groove more the first time than either computers or, by many people's accounts, other drum machines at the time. There was just something about it, the way it was set up. And I think it's because... I'd like to believe that I really understood a groove. Even when I was a musician and guitar player, I was very groove oriented. And I really tried, the first thing I've had to do is to try and get the bass and drums or the bass and guitar or whatever the, the core instruments were to be able to sink into a groove. And I think a lot of people who were producing at the time would just put the tracks up or they'd, they'd put the musicians together, they'd have a song in mind, but they'd miss that element of the groove. And if you don't have the groove, assuming it's groove oriented music, if you don't have the groove, you haven't got anything. And so I think if, if there's one thing maybe in overview that, that helped make the MPC uh, strong in the hip-hop fields, it was that the, the hip-hop players and I both really value groove as an essential element to making the music right. <clears throat> and like I say, if, if there's a groove happening and you walk into a room, you cannot not move. It's impossible. It's there and you feel it and it, it just sinks in, it resonates into something absolutely fundamental. <clears throat> and um, and I like to think that's what the MPC had. It, it was set up to groove. 
and, and you'd have to actually work hard to make it not groove as opposed to a lot of computer programs and other machines that you had to work hard to set it up to make it groove. You know? Well, you know, I, I do because I, I get wonderful compliments all the time from people in the hip-hop world and, um, and I, I uh, as I said before, I'm a little bit detached from it because I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not a, I don't listen to a lot of hip-hop, you know, I, I'm, I, uh, I guess, uh, I'm 50, you know. <laughs> I like, um, I tend to like soft music these days and so the beat is not as much in music that I, I play when I'm around home, you know, um, music with beat in, in general, you know, um, I guess I tend to like things that are very soft and, and uh, uh, but at the same time, yeah, you know, I can appreciate it, right? Uh, um, it, it's, I, I think it's difficult from an internal perspective to see it from an external perspective, um, but uh, it's kind of nice sometimes I'll, I'll see uh, producers and um, and you know they'll tell me how much the machine has been a, a great tool for them and, and things like that and it feels great but yeah it, it's kind of hard to really experience from an external perspective uh, uh, so yes and no you know, I, I understand because I've been told repeatedly how much an influence it has had and um, and I appreciate that and, and yeah I'm, I'm not really right in the center of it so you know I've kind of made a brush and then the artist has to decide what to paint with it. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't think... I, I was very conscious of the groove in making the, the MPC, and then, but the groove changed and, and became this wonderful uh, music called hip-hop. <clears throat> and, uh, um, and who knows what it'll be in the next decade, or this decade even, you know? Um, it's, it, you really can't, from my perspective, I, I'm, as I say, the guy that made the brush. And, and, the, and the painters out there, the hip hop artists, are the people that decided what to paint with it. And uh, if you look throughout history, uh, technology has always had this wonderful influence on art. For example, uh, the invention of the camera obscura around 1850 uh, changed um, what painters did for a living. The portrait artists, who were basically renderers, were kind of out of a job after that. And so you started to have the influence of Impressionism and, and, um, and the artist's vision of what lies in the painting as opposed to just making a, a perfect rendering because you could take a photo and you had a perfect rendering. Well, I think it's the same thing. I saw this happen a lot of times. In the, in the 60s, uh, there were string players that would come into pop sessions and, and um, you'd have you know, four or eight of them there and they'd, they'd take their session pay and, and walk out for playing one note over a song like Hey Jude, Beatles song or something. And then ARP, had, ARP instruments had the string synthesizer and those guys were out of a job. And then there was horn synthesizers, so that it affected what people did on, on music. And it wasn't just putting people out of a job, but it was creating a, a new creative tool that you could do interactively, you could compose interactively. And so, you know, before drum machines, then people would hire drummers, and drummers would play what they would do. But sometimes you wanted to have a guy just sit there and play a beat for 20 hours, you know, and you couldn't do that. There was a guy named Giorgio Moroder who did a lot of disco hits in the 70s that used to do that. He used to have a drummer go out and play a bass drum on quarters. And, and, um, and then just loop that tape and do that. And he had this elaborate apparatus for creating a drum machine before drum machines existed. Um, and so he loved it right off the bat. And then, uh, um, and others did. Uh, and there were various things like the quantize, you know, moving the, the notes onto the beat that allowed people who didn't have particularly good rhythm but had great rhythmic ideas to be able to create group, uh, beats that really groove. So, all these little inventions come along and sometimes you happen on, upon them by accident, but you really don't know as the inventor, uh, the product creator, what people are going to do with it. I think the conclusion is I try to do the best I can, but you never can tell what the truly creative artist is going to use your tool for. Um, did anyone ever think that uh, in the invention of the vinyl record that someone would be scratching with it? You know, no way, right? And it's, it's just a, uh, did anyone ever think that vinyl records would still be popular for DJs um, after the CD? I never would have guessed it. You know, all you can do is you can take your best shot at predicting the future, but usually you're wrong. And, and who tells you uh, what the future is? The artist. And that's the purpose of the artist in culture, is to predict the future, right? Before everybody else. <laughs> and usually it's the starving artist, right? So.
Well, I guess what I would say about software, I was mostly making a comment about some of the earlier software in the 80s when the computers were a bit slower. The timing was a bit ragged. <clears throat> and, uh, but computers are much faster now, and clearly all, most of, of music is made on computers. So I have no uh, complaints about computers now. The only thing I would say about computers is, is that, is that um, uh, you know, this is not a drum pad, and, and, uh, and that picture of a button on the screen is not a real button. And at, at best, you can roll around a little bar of soap and press one button and one knob at a time. <clears throat> Uh, I think the biggest limitation in computers these days has to do with a lack of a proper human interface. Uh, and in the MPC, I thought quite a lot about where are those pads and buttons and, and the display being next to everything, where everything should go so that when you walk up to it and you're using it in a day-to-day -day process, you can work very, very fast. <clears throat> now there's actually no shortage of user interfaces. Um, there are pad interfaces, there are button interfaces. Um, uh, there are, there are some good interfaces out there. It's just that the, 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 the computers, the software under the computers are not um, very, usually very tightly integrated with the user interfaces that exists out there. You know, you'll have a, a, um, an interface with some pads and some buttons and you have to program it to work with this software or that software. But I don't see a lot of great opportunities for a, a total system where you've got software and a user interface that really are meant to work together well. And even if they do work together well, you know, there's always the problem of operating systems. You get crashes or you get interface problems, communication errors, and, and sometimes you walk up to your machine and you're all ready to make music and, and it doesn't work and you're spending the next half hour finding out what driver, did, what driver crashed or, you know, if you did your email on it, what uh, program ate one of your music drivers or something like that. And it, it's still a problem, you know, even with a simple uh, computer like Macintosh and even programs like GarageBand that come with it made by Apple. You know, you, you turn the machine back on and the driver didn't load properly, so you have to quit the program and come back and, and load it again. And, you know, there is something nice about just being able to walk up to a musical instrument and it plays. You know, there's, there's no uh, screen on this guitar uh, that, that says, you know, driver error, DLL not loaded. You know, I just turn it on, I, I, I play the guitar, you don't have to turn it on, it's already there. And I play it and that's it. And that's very, very nice. And I guess uh, a part of my life's goal is to, is to make, the trans, make the technology as transparent as possible. Uh, and, and all that said though, I think it's an absolutely wonderful um, innovation that, that music is being made on um, computers because that the very nature of the malleability of the, the instruments being comprised of software makes the rate of change far, far faster. And so ideas are just popping and it's an absolutely wonderful time to be making music now. You know, the changes are great. If you're talking about sound quality, that's an issue of um, audio interfaces and there are some very, very nice audio interfaces out there. And as far as the sound, I mean, you're basically manipulating bits. Bits don't sound one way or another, if they, a bit is a bit, no matter where you move it along, you'll have, um, you, you have in still some computer systems, you'll get a certain amount of jitter, which is the irregularity in timing, if the system is not fast enough, or if it's Windows, <laughs> or something like that. But, you know, if, the thing is, if you really fine tune a system, it, it works well. The trouble is, it's not everybody's great at fine tuning a system, and, and you've got bands now where you've basically got one musician and one engineer, you know, it's like kind of like the, the management information system of the, of the band, you know, the, the guy that operates on the computers, you know, he's a member of the band these days, you know, um, to really get it right. And then one complaint I have about a lot of the programs is they're so complex uh, that sometimes it's a rather daunting experience for a musician to come up to a program like Logic or Mark the Unicorn or, or any of them and to really figure out how to get the music in their head into this software program. It can be very difficult. And uh, so, you know, it's a hard task. What do you do? Everybody really wants the features. And I think ultimately people are more seduced by the features than they are by a promise of simplicity. And so, um, everybody's competing on features. And at some point it'll settle down. And I think it already has, has started to do so. GarageBand on Mac, I think it's a, it's a superb program for ma making the essentials of music. Um, and, um, and much, much easier. And I think that will inspire people to, to make software that's much, much easier.
it's a fine line now between instrument and uh, between recording machine and musical instrument. If you think about it, what's funny, um, as we've been discussing, the people that use MPCs, what are they called? Uh, MPC players? No. They're called producers. Now, it used to be the producer was the person who gathered the musician and the songwriter and the singer together and produced a piece of music. <clears throat> In other words, they saw music from an overview and they used these tools to, to create it. Well, the producer today does the same thing on, on an MP or whatever his tool of choice is on the computer, right? I think that's beautiful because, uh, in a sense, because people are no longer limiting themselves to this one little chunk of the music. They're, everybody's thinking of the overview. And, and uh, the, the good news is, is that, that someone can hear music in their head and realize it. You know, I don't think Beethoven or Mozart could have done that. He had to, to think of these, he had to imagine the instruments and then get the players together and if they didn't play well, you know, you fucked, right? <clears throat> but everybody today are able, the editing and, and creation process are so interactive that you can not only realize what you hear in your head pretty well, but you get surprised by the tools. They bring something to you that you wouldn't have thought of. I remember what I used to do with early NPCs sometimes is I just put on, I put the metronome on with a, maybe a 54% swing and on 66% 60, 60, uh, timing correct, turn the sound off and just bang on the pads a little bit and see what I get back. And sometimes you get great grooves. It really would work well. Or sometimes you just manipulate it a little bit or put four on the floor and, and, and on top of this randomness you get this wonderful thing that sounded like this cacophony of, of a, um, some sort of a South American rhythm or something, you know, it would be really great. And it's that, that ability to, for the machine to influence you um, that I think is great. But it, it, regretting your original question, the, the machine is the instrument today. It, if you think about it, there are really kind of only two instruments left, the computer and the turntable. <clears throat> Who plays violin? Somebody who's, some young, academic kid who's basically living his parents' life is, is who's playing violin, right? Who plays English horn? Forget about it, you know? The, the, if there are any acoustic instruments that are left, they're sort of keys, guitar, drums, and sax is probably the best of the wind instruments that's left. <clears throat> but, you know, how many people do you know that are really studying saxophone compared to people who are playing computer or playing turntable, right? The instrument is the turntable. There's this sort of a continuum, and on the one end is the the listener on the other end is the creator, and there's all these points in between, and they're beautiful points. Like a DJ, is he a listener or is he a creator? Well, he's, he's closer to the listener side, but he's a few notches into creator. <clears throat> and, and somebody who uses Ableton Live, right? Um, or using an MPC to do real-time um, uh, composition on the fly, where he, he brings tracks in and out. He's a few notches in towards creator, but did he create all those notes? No. But he's standing on the, on the shoulders of the giants who created the original loops. <clears throat> and that's the beauty. It's just, it's mixed up now, you know, in, in a beautiful way. Anybody can choose where they want to be on that continuum. They can create individual notes and they can be a violinist and, and, and wait five years before you can even get a good tone on your violin. Or you can just be a DJ and spin vinyl <clears throat> and put things together in such a way that you really can move a crowd of people. <clears throat> or you can use Ableton Live or you can use MP and, and you can get out there and, and on stage and you can put these things together that are really marvelous. I was in a, a bar in, in uh, or a, a club in, in um, Dublin uh, a few years back <clears throat> to speak at some DJ conference and, and uh, and the night started with a three-piece rock band, and they were playing there, and it was a standard guy thing, a guy playing guitar with his guitar down around his knees and a sort of a dirty white shirt and, you know, looking kind of scruffy and, and singing his own songs as a bass player and a drummer, and they're real loud. And the crowd just sort of stand there and looking at him. And then the DJ came up. There were two guys with turntables, some with electronics, and everybody was moving. You know, it was an entirely different scene. There was an electricity in the room <clears throat> that you couldn't reproduce in this three-piece rock band, you know? <clears throat> and it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing how much um, is being done in ways that, that people didn't expect and people didn't think of. What I'm excited most about now is making new ideas, making new instruments for the future, that, um, and then seeing where they'll go from there. We have this wonderful time where the, the software is, is, um, is popping out ideas left and right because it's, it's so malleable. Um, the limitation now I see is more in the human interface. Um, uh, there are a few very, very bright guys 
who are making new interfaces for the computer to, for, to play music on. Um, actually, in Paris, in, in September or August, there's a, a conference on, uh, called uh, NIM, N-I-M-E, something about conference on human interfaces. And there are a lot of ideas popping there, too. There's a guy here in Berkeley named Don Buchla, who's made these wonderful controllers called Thunder, one called Lightning, where you use uh, body gestures to, um, to be interpreted into music. He has one where you hold these two little devices in the air, and, and if you shake one in this cubic space of air, it makes one sound. If you shake it over here, it makes a different sound. Um, and I'd like to see, my question is, is in 20 years, or maybe 30 years, there's going to be new instruments. And I'm just curious what they're going to be. And I'd love to be the guy who is influential in their design. But think about it. You've got still people playing strings and, and acoustic drums and, and, um, and, and reeds and, and, um, <clears throat> and brass and, and uh, things like that. And those are great. And they're wonderful. And I love them. And they'll, they'll be around for a long time. <clears throat> but you've also got computers except in the interface. Now a keyboard is a horrible interface for a musical instrument because it's linear. You can go up and down with that key. It's not very good. You can have controllers like a pitch pin wheel, which is a really a sucky interface, or a mod wheel. <clears throat> but think about it. I've got ten fingers, and I've got toes, and I've got knees, and I've got um, a mouth that I can do uh, wind expression with. I've got arms, I've got body gestures, I've got dance body gestures if I want to use them. Um, uh, you can even do things like, uh, there's a guy who lives a couple of streets up from me named Jaron Lanier who worked out a program where the computer can watch through a camera his facial expressions and depending on his facial expressions it alters the timbre of the, um, of the tone of the instrument he's playing. Um, there's another guy, Keith McMillan, who has a trio called Trio Metric, where he actually plays a guitar, um, uh, somebody else plays a violin, and someone else plays a string bass, and every string is wired up into the computer, into a complex program he's written, and a string, the dynamics of a particular string, can affect the tone of the other instrument, they all interact electronically. Um, there's John Chowning, who's having a concert, um, he's the guy that invented uh, he's a former professor at Stanford. He, Stanford, he invented uh, FM synthesis that was used in the popular uh, Yamaha DX1, DX7 synthesizers. He's, he's using uh, uh, new interfaces and new synthesis methods on computer and doing new ideas. There's all these wonderful little ideas. There's some wonderful guys in, in France out of your camp. <clears throat> uh, they're doing these amazing things, and they're all just little things that are at sort of nerdy concerts right now and doing weird uh, music that that not too many people subscribe to yet, but it's going to grow and some instrument is going to take shape that's, that's going to be popular, some interface, and another direction is going to happen over here, and it's going to converge into maybe three, five, or a hundred different instruments and somewhere around the, the middle of the, the 21st century, and I would just love to find out what those are. I'd like to find out what people are going to play and the beautiful music that's going to be made on these machines that have these capabilities that acoustic machines just by their very nature cannot have. You know, all these ideas that are popping out, who would have thought of looping? Looping is in effect the interactive process of, of creating and editing, because you play it and it comes back around in the loop. Well, I actually thought of that in the first drum machines, give myself a little pat on the back. <clears throat> but the idea that you can play it in and immediately it loops back, um, that I think had an influence, right? Um, but uh, the idea of looping in general, of taking these loops and putting them together and taking pieces of other recordings and, and manipulating them and filtering them and, and, um, and changing pitch on them or timing or, or under these things, but doing this as an instrument where you also have, instead of a mixing console, which is an archaic interface, or an acoustic instrument, if you had something where you could use your, your hand gestures and your facial gestures and, 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 and the, the armature the, or the wind control that you have in a saxophone and put all these things together in something that if you want you can create an entire beautiful piece of music, the entire band, spontaneous yourself, or you can work with other instruments, other musicians, and they have instruments and they wirelessly communicate sync and musical key, musical mode, if you want. Um, and you can assign who plays what, and, and you can move these things around in real time. And you can have people jamming across the world simultaneously. And there's so many things that can happen that I think, uh, um, as I said before, it's, it's an absolutely phenomenal time to be alive. And if I could, 
the, my one wish is I would love, I'm, I'm working on these ideas now, it's hard to find anybody to fund it because money never cares about the future. Money seems to only care about the past. <clears throat> but if I could get funding, there are some very creative people to put together some new instruments that really embody some of these new ideas in an open source environment <clears throat> to be able to create new instruments at a faster pace than is happening now. And not just software, but, but human computer interface, gestural interfaces. Um, there, uh, there will be, there will, whether I'm involved or not, there will be phenomenal instruments coming to, to the fore in the next 10 or 20 years. And uh, my dream is to be a, a significant part of that. That's what I'm excited about now. To make the next hip hop, whatever it is. What am I doing now? Um, I'm, I'm making some products with the M Audio company. Um, M Audio is an interesting company. It was, it was founded by a guy named Tim Ryan. And um, what nobody knows about him or about M Audio is that he created a brilliant, uh, uh, very, very early digital synthesizer called the Conbrio. This was in 1975, I'm thinking, something like that. Um, and he's actually, the found, as the founder of M Audio, this was his uh, guiding vision. Of course, this thing was $30,000 at the time, and, and he, I think he found out that there's only so many $30,000 synthesizers you can buy. But it's a very creative company. And uh, as you may know, right now what they mainly specialize in is, um, is audio interfaces, MIDI interfaces for computer, and, and everything around um, the computer assuming you're making music with your computer. And so uh, I started working with M Audio, and what they did is they took, um, their idea was to take some of the best parts of my product with my company, Roger Lynn Design, called the Adrenaline, which is a, um, a rhythmic processor for guitar, and to turn it into a, a new product from M Audio, and they call this Black Box. Black Box being kind of a, a mysterious box that you don't know what's inside. And that's kind of what Black Box does. Wow. It's, it's like the Adrenaline, my product from my company, Rogerland Design. <clears throat> it uh, combines um, all these interesting filters and a looping sequencer inside and, uh, and beat synchronized effects uh, along with guitar amp modeling and drum machine and puts them into one little low cost box. Um, and this is what it is, called Black Box. So here's an idea. In a sense, you might think of it as kind of a groove box for guitar. So I can play along and I can play just something as, as simple as a chord. I don't know if you can hear, but it's actually repeating a two measure sequence of filter tones. drum machine in there too and all that uh, and you can do all kinds of sounds in it uh, in addition to all the things that a standard multi-effect product would do but what really turns me on is in the same way that uh, a product like the MPC can inspire you to go into different musical directions this has that same capability you can do all, all these sorts of things like that thing I'm just doing well here's another preset <laughs> 